Amy, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's good to see you guys, gals here tonight. Um, we definitely have a hack week, as they say. <laughs> yeah. And the court, they say, what's on the docket? Well, the docket is pretty full. And so we're looking at that. Uh, also, we're looking ahead down the road here, the very the next thing that's coming up is for all the guys. Up there, look at that. This is the men's conference, and we're looking at Saturday, April the 13th, at 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, I'll touch base with guys on Sunday as well. I'm Sunday here, obviously this Sunday here after we finish the Dos Lodos thing, but we're gonna need a head count, and that's why we put that other telephone number there. If you're gonna come, uh, it'll be in the bulletin on Sunday, but just text to that number right there, that's the second number, um, your name, and how many people are gonna be in your party? That way we have that head count because if I don't do that, the lady in that kitchen gets extremely mad. <laughs> and, and you don't want me to be on the receiving end of that. So please, okay, have mercy on me. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be a great conference. Uh, Chris Raleigh, uh, the Wildwood Calvary Chapel in Ukraine, a neat guy, fantastic speaker, really good. B.J. Heather, he's at Joshua Springs Calvary Chapel. That was... Uh, Jill Hageman was there, and we were there back in 2009 when I was with Raul Reese, and we were doing uh, the Somebody Loves You tours and stuff like that. That church was our key base because we did a thing for the Marine base out there, 29 Palms, and 3,500 Marines out there. And we did a barbecue for 3,500 Marines. Yeah, uh, but uh, Gerald is into missions now, and he turned things over to uh, BJ. He's a neat guy. These guys love the love the Lord, and basically, it's a man for all seasons. And we're taking a look at, you know, are we ready, guys? Are we ready for what's going to happen in 2024? I know here we are in March, but there's a lot of 2024 left, especially toward the end of the year. Things are going to happen. They're going to happen fast. So anyway, there's a plug right there. Uh, tonight, we're kind of building on what we went through Sunday. And Sunday we looked at, if you open your Bible, we looked at Luke 13 verses 10 through 17. But I want to take it a little step further tonight. I want to talk about two cripples, not one. Now, in the scriptures there, we're talking about the woman that was bent over, remember? She was bent way over, and she had to do this to look at someone. A curvature of the spine, uh, spine being fused, or so forth. Medically today, we were able to do a lot of diagnosis and stuff like this, but the Lord healed it. Right then and there. Right then and there. But I would suggest to you tonight that there were more than just one cripple there. And we're going to take a look at this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now, and Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that uh, you guide us. Help us tonight as we would take a look at your word and, and see, Father, the depth of what took place that day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. What we're going to look at here is pretty interesting. Let me open up with a story here. An organist was practicing one day in a great church in Europe. And remember, the churches in Europe is fantastic organs. It's unbelievable, incredible organs. Well, as he was playing, a man came up to the organ and asked if he could play. Now, the organist looked at the guy and basically said to himself, okay, I shouldn't let this man play. Just look at him, okay? He's unshaven, his clothes are soiled. He looks like he's down and out. So he told the man, no. I don't want you touching this keyboard. That's it. Well, but the unkept man, basically the stranger, asked again and again, please, can I, can I play that organ? Finally, the organist let him play, thinking he could, couldn't play, you know, very long. But what does the down and out guy, you know, what can he do with an organ? Okay, maybe he just wants to pound the keys or whatever, I don't know. Well, the down and out guy's fingers started to dance across the keyboard, 
and the organist hadn't heard anything like that in his lifetime. What well, in his lifetime? The stranger played on and on and on, and the organist basically was spellbound at the ability and the musicianship of this old man. Okay. When the stranger got up to leave, the organist couldn't stop, you know, contain himself, and he said, "Who are you?" What's your name? Well, the down and out man slowly walked away and he turned and said over his shoulder, my name is Felix Mendelssohn, one of the greatest organists and composers of all time. Point being, the organist gasped, obviously, and he said to himself, I almost did not let the master play. The organist had almost let his prejudice get the better of him. It would have missed out on one of the most greatest, awesome moments of, of his life. Here, Mendelssohn actually played the keyboard. That's where he was. Well, we have prejudices which we need to overcome. Now, the text. The text also deals with prejudice, and in this case, the prejudice that the Sabbath was so holy that you can't even heal on the Sabbath. That's the prejudice. You, you can't heal. You're gonna have, she's gonna have to suffer one more day. And remember the story, he gets up and he says, you know, there's six days for you to do this. So do it on the sixth day, but you can't do it on this day. That's all there is to it. I'm sorry, she's gonna have to suffer one more day. That does not ring well with God, okay? Excuse me, especially if you're the one who's suffering. Yeah, I don't want to get healed now. I don't want to be put off. Okay? Jesus dealt with the prejudice by healing one of the two cripples who met him in the gospel reading. Now, I would like to ask which one went away healed. I'm talking about two cripples. Okay? Now, you might ask, I only saw one there. It's just the one. Think, think about this for a second. The two people that met with Jesus that morning were, I would suggest to you, both crippled in their own way. Here's one. Obvious, right? The first cripple was obviously the woman. She was physically crippled. One Bible commentator has said that uh, her deformity was due to having the bones of her spine fused in a rigid mass. That was it. Okay. Now the scripture tells us that she had been crippled for how many years? 18 years. <clears throat> Can you imagine? 18 years crippled. Having to go around bent over like that, okay? Disability, it was obvious. It was a real miracle to heal her. She went away from Jesus, what? Healed. A touch of the master's hand. Now, but there's a second cripple here. The second cripple might surprise you. It was the ruler of the synagogue. He too was crippled by a spirit, the spirit of legalism. Legalism will cripple you. Well, we, what, the, the, the seven most deadliest words, we've always done it that way, <laughs> but we've never done it that way. Those are the deadliest words out there. That's a prejudice. Well, we can't do that because of this. Well, Jesus did that. So this is another crippled person here, but it's crippled spiritually. That, it was interesting to see that Jesus was able to touch her physical body and heal her, but this guy was crippled more than she was. Yeah, because he was narrow-minded in what he felt God was saying. He was interpreting the scripture through himself instead of interpreting the scripture to allow scripture to interpret itself. The best book to interpret the Bible is the Bible. Plain and simple. The spirit of legalism can be a real killjoy. And it was in there, as you, as you saw, okay? Instead of rejoicing that God had worked a wonderful miracle, he set about to denigrate. That's what he did. You can't do that. You're not supposed to do that. And after, he, after Jesus did that, he, he, he got all upset. 
What about the woman who just walked away healed after 18 years of absolute agony? What about that? Now you might ask, okay, who was he? Who was this guy? Well, the synagogue was a church in Jesus' day. It was a place God's people went to worship God. Now, the synagogue ruler was a man who ran the services. In today's language, you might say he would be either a priest or a minister. The people would look up to him for spiritual guidance. That's basically what we're looking at there. Well, why did he decide to take issues with Jesus? There's a question. Why did he decide to do that? May I put forth this? Hmm. Yeah. Part of the reason might be that he felt myth or been out of shape that Jesus' healing was an invasion of his prerogative. What did you just do? Wow, that, that's an insult to me. But I think the major reason was because uh, what Jesus did offended his understanding of the law of God. You are offending my understanding of what the Bible says. This is where he may be coming from on this as we look into this. Okay? So I asked the question. What's the issue? What was the underlying issue behind all of this stuff? Now, the issue wasn't that Jesus had healed a woman. No one claimed that Jesus' healing was other than from God. No. It was God himself who did it. No one disputed that that was a good deed. Absolutely. Nobody disputed that. <coughs> Rather, it was the day that Jesus chose to perform the healing that caused the the mess that caused the argument, that caused the, the furor, if you might say. It was the day. That's what the situation was. He did it on the what? Sabbath. Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath. Okay? And the Pharisees had defined that as what? Work. They would... I find it interesting, and we're going to get into two things. We're going to get into the Talmud and the Mishnah. And watch Dennis go, oh, what did you say? Talmud and Mishnah? Yeah. They had the Old Testament. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wanted to define God's word more. Let's, let's really refine it. So they would write a book about how you read the Old Testament. And then they went further and they would write another book called the Mishnah to understand how you would determine how to understand the Talmud, how you would understand how to understand the Old Testament. <laughs> Give me a break. Okay? What happened to the simple one sheet of paper? These are the, five, these are the ten things. Go home. No, no, no. They make it so good. What did Jesus say? He said, you make rules so binding that it's said, waiting. You crush people with them. Laws upon laws upon laws upon laws. Uh, and they would find ways to get around it, as an honest politician would do. <coughs> I'm sorry I said that word. I didn't mean to say that. Okay. Um, for instance, you couldn't go 50 yards past your house on the Sabbath. Well, how could we get around it? I don't know. They would go and they would gather some sticks, and they would put them in a sack before the Sabbath. And then, when they walked out of the house, they would walk 50 yards and they would drop a stick. That's part of that house. So now they can walk another 50 yards and drop a stick. Mm-hmm, right. Hey, Washington and Sacramento had nothing on these guys. Okay, they, these guys were good. I mean, they could figure out a way of wiggling around stuff, the likes of which you could not believe. But for you, oh, no, 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 no. You do as I say, not as I do. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Same old, same old. And this is what was happening, okay? Israel had been overrun by the Romans, and the Jews were struggling to keep their identity. They were struggling to keep their identity, okay? Their identity, see if I got the right slide, there we go. Their identity was bound up in their God and the covenant, what we know is called the Old Testament that they had with him, with God, basically. And they believed that only by slavishly keeping the rules of that covenant could they satisfy God. 
It's interesting. You're hearing Jesus. He talked about the Bible. He said, "Head on earth will pass away, and my word will never pass away." And then he would use a phrase like a jot and a tittle. Every jot and tittle. For us, it would be like a parenthesis, a comma, or a period. None of that will pass away. Everything will be there. Every single thing. Okay. The issue for the ruler of the synagogue was that by healing on the Sabbath, Jesus was breaking the fourth commandment. You might want to write down Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. He's breaking the fourth commandment. You can't do that. And what was that? Okay. I didn't write it. Put, put it up here, but here it is. Remember? Remember the what? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons nor your daughters, nor your manservants, nor your maidservants, nor your animals, nor your aliens within within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Boom! It has come down from the mountain. And that is what you will do. And that's it. And remember how Jesus argued <coughs> me, back with them? What did he use? Everyday things in common sense. You got an animal. It's tied up. It's thirsty. Don't you go over and bring the animal over to the water to have a drink? An ox? You know, or a donkey? Isn't this daughter of Abraham worth more than that ox or donkey? You're applying the spirit of the law to the animals, but you demand the letter of the law for people. What's going on there? Why are you doing that? There is always the spirit of the law, and there is always the letter of the law. Uh, <clears throat> many of you know that you know, I have 15 years as reserve deputy for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and I had many, many opportunities to observe the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. Okay. You get up behind a car, and you turn lights on, and the person in the car has what they call white and black feet. They panic. You, the, your blood pressure rises and everything, that's it, you pull over, and you start talking to the person, and you did this, and so forth, and so on. Um, many times, I would say, okay, you need to watch out. Don't do that again. Da, 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 da. And they're on their way. And even 40 feet away, you could hear, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, please. But then there were times that it was blatant, and you know, a red ticket for you, and that's it. That's the letter of the, the law. The letter of the law has no mercy. You break the law, you pay. That's it. Period. The spirit of the law has mercy. You might ask, what's the issue here? Jesus isn't working on the Sabbath. Is, it, is he? Is Jesus working on the Sabbath? He's not charging for his services, is he? No. Okay. He didn't, you know, say, okay, write the check out to Jesus of Nazareth mm -hmm. and we'll deposit it in the bank. No. Indeed, he is helping a human being. Well, anyway. in order to avoid breaking the commandments, the Pharisees had fenced the commandments around with more severe rules. These are found in Basically, the Jerome the Talmud. Let me read an example for you. You might want to write this down. This is out of the Talmud. Okay. For example, one Pharisaic rule regarding the Sabbath held that an animal could be led out to water provided nothing was carried. That's the reading of that in the Talmud. Plain and simple. Okay. A man could draw water for the animal and pour it into a trough for the animal to drink from, but to avoid breaking the fourth commandment could not hold the bucket for the animal to drink out of. <laughs> yeah. This is, it is laborious. It is like mind splitting what these people would think about. Uh, here's another example here. 
Another such parasitic rule was that you are only allowed to medically treat a man for an illness on the Sabbath when the man's life was in danger. It was held to be okay to break the fourth commandment in a life-threatening situation. However, in the Talmud, pardon me, in the Mishnah it says, you could not break the fourth commandment just to alleviate suffering. You're going to suffer one more day. You could see, I'm glad I wasn't there and I'm glad I'm not Jesus. I would lose it right there and there. Said, you guys are idiots. Okay? This poor woman. You have no feeling for her whatsoever. You must follow the law. No. What about human beings, okay? Well, here's a question. Why is Jesus so hard on the synagogue ruler? Why he come down? He came on, he came down in like a ton of bricks. Right? Because he's a hypocrite. And that's what he said, literally in the scripture. I mean, you're a hypocrite. You do that for an animal, but you won't do it for a human being. Aren't human beings more valuable than an animal? Now, I know people that, wait a minute, you know, we see the advertisements of the SPCA and the suffering dog and stuff, and I get that, and we help out and all that there. But guess what? God's highest creation, I'm looking at it right here. You're looking at me right here. This is God's highest creation. He made you what? In his image. You know, we love animals, we love cats and dogs and you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. We, we love all of that. Okay, but when it comes right down to it, people, number one. Number one. That's it. They didn't do that, okay? And why did he come down on them so hard? Well, Jesus said to the ruler, like I said, you're a hypocrite. Those are hard words, not the way to make friends and influence people. For sure. That's not the way to do it, okay? But why did he do it? Well, here's one reason. I think it was because the man was implicitly claiming to act on God's behalf and yet flatly contradicting the spirit of God's law. I kind of think that. There's probably a lot more behind it, but I think that's what the issue was. Basically, the man was implicitly claiming to act on God's behalf. I'm speaking for God. Rule number one, don't speak for God. He can speak for himself. How did he do that? He gave us 66 books right here to speak. Everything he needs to say is right in this book, right here. Every single thing. A library. So he is, in one sense, adding to. He's trying to stretch it out. It is the spirit of God's law that counts, not the letter of the law. Look at Jesus' reasoning here. If on the Sabbath you untie your donkey and lead it to water, why should this woman, who has been bent over for 18 years, not be set free? Perfect logic. He don't want to hear it. Ever run across a person who, who says, <clears throat> Don't confuse me, my mind is made up. They're locked in. They dig their heels in. And no matter what you say, which makes common sense, and Jesus just used common sense, he didn't want to hear it. He was doing, na 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 like this. He, I don't want to hear you. What I say is interpreting God to you. You must listen. No. No. Legalism had so crippled the ruler's mind that he could not see how inconsistent his words were. There's an inconsistency there. He couldn't see it. Jesus pointed it out. It was it was as big as a Hummer coming down the road, okay? You could see this thing a mile away. He could not see it because he was all tied up. That's it. He couldn't see it. He was abiding. There we go. <coughs> He was abiding by the spirit of the law for animals, but abiding by the letter of the law for people. Wow. Think about that. He's turned it on its head. Turned it upside down. This is what he did. Okay? 
instead of reacting as he did, pardon me, instead of yeah, reacting as he did, the ruler should have gone away rejoicing at the woman's good fortune. But he didn't. He hated the fact that Jesus healed this woman. He despised the fact. Well, let me go to one observation. There are people today that have what I call Sabbath prejudice, which hinder them from seeing Jesus work in other people's lives. The rules that people add over and above what the scriptures say. They do. Another story I found. I remember reading of a little church in, in the United States who had invited a good preacher to come to preach. So this was back around oh, 1900, somewhere around there. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, they withdrew their invitation on the morning of the sermon. Why? Well, because he did not appear in a belt and suspenders on his pants. <laughs> belt and suspenders. Okay, let me explain why. Their reasoning was that without suspenders, if the belt slipped, mm -hmm. the preacher's trousers would fall down while he was preaching, and that would very be scandalous. Horrifying. It's a true story. Okay, I don't know what church this was. So they insisted a rule that all preachers had to have a belt and suspenders on before they preached. They would check you to make sure you had suspenders uh, and a belt. Their spirit of legalism caused them to miss out on what God wanted to say to them through that preacher that morning. Legalism is heavy. It is like a hundred pounds of wet sand on your shoulders. Okay? It's heavy. Legalism is what it does. Their, their spirit of legalism was, was horrifying. It's usually a killjoy, like I said, but the fruit of the spirit is different. Look at what Paul says regarding the fruit of the Spirit. Remember Galatians 5.22? But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, faithless, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. No law. This is what it's about. The Christian life is meant for us in Jesus Christ. Not to be heavy. <clears throat> Sometimes we impose upon ourselves a heaviness that we don't have to. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to follow what God's Word tells us. We need to do that. Every life, my life, your life, has boundaries. The boundaries are between these two cups right here. That's it. Boundaries are good. They're good because they keep us between those two countries right there. They keep us in God's Word. See what you're talking about. Um, can you think of another boundary? How about the center divider on the freeway? Is that a good boundary? I think so. It keeps that from coming here, and it keeps me from going there. Boundaries are important because they set up in your life and they set up in my life a way for us to follow Jesus Christ and to be able to stay on that track. Remember, he says what? It's narrow. It's narrow. But wide is the other path. And so those boundaries that God says to you and he says to me, a lot of people will say sometimes, you know, I don't want to become a Christian because it just kills all the good stuff in the world. It kills all the fun I have. So, you have fun. Let me think for a second. Okay. You either stay out on a Saturday night and get drunk out of your mind, or you get drunk on a Sunday night, and then you have to get up early on Monday morning, you have to head out to here, or you've been on drugs, and you're stressed out on drugs, and you're, you're losing your job, you're losing everything, but man, I remember the good old days, that was fun. No, it wasn't. It was miserable. Absolute misery. Why? Because I wanted no boundaries in my life. We have to have boundaries. They're, uh, they're important, they're implicit for, for our living to do what God wants us to do. You see, 
here's the issue. The woman went away rejoicing in her healing. The synagogue ruler missed out. Which begs the question. When I stay in God's boundaries, I'm not going to be missing out on God's blessings. If I venture outside of his boundaries and I become very legalistic, I'm going to miss out on his blessings. Have you ever met people and again, don't raise your hand, don't look at the person next to you. Don't look at me. Okay. They are so legalistic that and you know they look like they've been baptized in mad vinegar. They're just what I call them sour posts. You know. They have the big old Schofield Bible underneath their arm and they, you know, you must follow the law, and that's it. Yeah. They are a killjoy. There's there's no fun. Jesus said, I've come that you might have death. Is that what he said? No. I've come that you might have life and live it more abundantly. And how do I do that? Within the boundaries that he has given you and he has given me. That's where my life is at. Because when I stay in there, I know that I'm in the center of his will. The, uh, what I call a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot. And that sweet spot is in the center of his will. Read the covers of that book to where I have all kinds of latitude in them. It's like people in the world say, uh, I'm free to do whatever I want. Really? Think about that. Are you free? No, you're not. You're a slave to your own feelings and you're a slave to the world and the world view. Jesus said, I've come to what? Set you free. And that freedom, again, lies within that boundary. In fact, that's John 10.10, 10, which is the very next verse. I have come that you might have life and live it abundant, in abundance. <clears throat> Having that abundant life is being able to realize that God does lay rules down for us. God does all these things out. But guess what? It is for my own good. It is for your own good. Uh, who here would have like a, and I've used this before a lot of times, uh, my step-granddaughter, Annalise, uh, she would, you know, run around the house and do all kinds of crazy stuff. She's eight years old, and she's, she, she's eight years old going on 35. <laughs> she's just a ball of energy. But like, uh, she'll come up with some crazy idea that she wants to do something, and she'll uh, go into the kitchen and she'll want to try to turn the microwave on and, and put the silver water in. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, because number one, it's going to blow up. Number two, you're going to get hurt. And she'll get mad at something like this and she wants to do some crazy idea and she'll get all puffed up and she'll start doing the, what a seven or eight year old do. Uh, yeah. I've seen 45 year old people do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't want you to do that because you're going to get hurt. God says the same thing to you and I. Don't do that. I'm not a killjoy, but I know that that will hurt you. Moreover, when it hurts you, you're going to hurt somebody else because hurt people hurt people. They always do. There's no escaping that. I'm a Christian because Jesus gives me abundant life. You're a believer, a Christian, because Jesus gives you abundant life. Let's, let's not lose out by putting up unnecessary barriers like the synagogue ruler did to the work of Jesus. Stay inside those lines and you will work. That's one of the first things they teach you in, in kindergarten when they give you a crayon and give you something to, to draw on. Can somebody tell me? Stay inside what? The lines. Yeah. Stay inside the lines. So I need to follow that all of my life. Wait past six years old. Stay inside the lines because when I stay inside the lines, my life is going to be better. It's not going to be perfect, but 
There's no perfect life here on in this world. There isn't. Okay? It's a better life. It's a fulfilling life. Uh, you know, rain falls on the just and the unjust. It's going to fall on you. It's going to fall on me. It's going to fall on the bad guy, the bad lady. That's the way it is. But overall, your life and my life are going to be more fulfilled in the midst of it all. Why? Because I've stayed right here. Staying right here. That's what does it. Basically, I believe this. I believe that the challenge of this evening's lesson is to watch out lest we set up our own set of prejudices that stop us from seeing the work of Jesus in the lives of others. Not just the work of Jesus in your life, the work in my life, but it's the work of other people. Other people. Jesus was interested in the other. Who was that? The woman. Jesus was also interested in what? The other crippled guy. The guy. He wanted no part of it. No part of it at all. She went away healed. He went away mad. Who's the winner of that one? The woman. The woman. Why? Because she trusted him. And because she stayed within those boundaries. It's important that my life and that your life follow that pattern. That pattern that Jesus said when he said, I'm coming to you by an abundant life. So often we we look at that scripture, <laughs> John 10, 10, and we say, Abundance. What does that mean? Well, we're going to have a big checking account. <laughs> we're going to have a car in the garage. We're going to have a house. And, you know, and all that good I stuff. Yeah. Uh, we think of what? Stuff. We equate abundance with stuff because it's the English word uh, abundance. I got, you know, there's an abundance of chairs here, there's an abundance of tables here. We think in the physical. Think in the spiritual. Your greatest gifts in your life are the untangible ones. The ones you can't touch. What is the value of your love for a child or a grandchild? Can you put a price on that? The value of the life of a husband or wife, can you put a price on that? It's incalculable. It's the connection. The value of salvation through Jesus Christ. How much does it cost to have your sins forgiven? It costs Jesus everything. But it costs you. Why? Because salvation is a free gift. Here it is. Absolutely free. You don't have to pay a dime for it. You just receive it. You see, that's the issue. That abundant life is a, is a life that is abundant of the spirit and of the soul more than it is of the physical things. If God blesses you physically, that's great. Praise the Lord for it. That's great. If you know, if <coughs> if you've got a good job or you're retired or whatever, and you've got this and that, thank God for it. Absolutely. But your greatest gift, your greatest thing, are not the physical. Because you and I know one big rule. It ain't going to last. It's not going to last. Uh, as Chuck Smith used to say, it's all going to burn. It's all, it's all going to burn. A thousand years from now, if the Lord tarries, we're physically not going to be here. We'll be up in heaven. But guess what? This beautiful building and everything like that, it'll be dust. If the Lord waits a thousand years, I have no idea what we'll be here. And you know what? When we're there, I can care less about what's going on here. You want to blow it up? Blow it up. Okay, you want to do whatever? But that's it, you know? But guess what? We'll have an eternity with him. Why? Because we stayed in the mountains and we followed his word. That doesn't mean that we're not going to fail. It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin. That, but he forgives us. If, what's one of the first verses that I learned? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you better believe it. 
John 1 time. Baby. <coughs> because it's real. So there are two cripples. One walked away completely healed, praising God. The crowd was praising God and marveled at everything that he did. The other guy went away, bah humbug. And it wasn't even Christmas. He wanted to be legal. He wanted to be legal. You want the letter of the law. You got it. You got it. Um, how many people see, I'm sure everybody has, um, you know, the John has some Ten Commandments. Anybody seen that? Everybody seen that? There's, one, there's a lot of lines in it. It's a fantastic movie. One line, and they have they play a little bit with the script on that. But the one line, Essence coming down from the mountain, and you've got Joshua there, and you've got all the people, the reverie going on, and then he stops. And then he says to them, If you will not live by the law, you will die by the law. Remember that? And boy, did they die. <laughs> yeah. The law kills. It does. What the law does is it shows me I am guilty before God, like I said Sunday, and there's no way out except Jesus Christ. No way out. I am a sinner. And God looks upon me, but he looks upon me through Jesus' coming blessings. My son. Why? The blood. What blood? The blood on Calvary. The blood over the doorposts and on the sides. <laughs> the Passover. The death angel will pass over. Why? Your sins are forgiven. That's it. The law by itself it condemns me. It condemns you. There is no way out. But guess what? Like we all know, Jesus made a way. He made a way in the wilderness. He made a way for three million Jews. He made a way. And he's making a way in your life today. I don't know what the situation is with you, or the challenge that you may have, but I do know this. Put your trust in the one who can part an ocean. Because if he can part an ocean, he can part your problem. He can part my problem. And he's done it for you in the past. Everybody's different here. You've all faced your oceans. You've all faced Pharaoh behind you and mountains on both sides of you. And God has done it. And you know he's done it. Yeah. Give him the glory and say, God, I trust you. I want to save your mountain. Because that's it. Because realize this, when the, when the Jews went through the water, they had boundaries. What? A wall of water on both sides of them. But they stayed in the middle. And they walked across on what? Dry land. Walk across the thing that God's opening up for you and watch what you do. Any thoughts about tonight's teaching and where we are and the, uh, the second uh, sick person, shall we say there, the, the second crippled person? Don't everybody speak at once. Uh, oh, yeah. He was speaking for God. That's where he was coming from. And his own feelings. I'm speaking for God. This is, you're offending my prerogative because I'm the person that's supposed to speak for God, not you. I'm, I'm a leader of the synagogue, not you. And that's, that's that happens today. And a, and a, a lot of churches and stuff like this. And when you start saying, you know, I will explain to you what God, what you can do and what you can't do, and with my interpretation, run, do not walk to the nearest exit. Yeah. The only one who can do that is the one who wrote the book. 
and stay within that. That's what that is. Good question. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I wasn't able to make that Sunday where they spoke, but I know the reason I went on that trip to Haiti was because I sensed the need in my own spirit to get in a place where I could be energized in sharing my faith. And so um, that was, you know, it says a law brings death, the spirit gives life. And, you know, Christ I came, you might have a life, you might have it abundantly, but part of that abundant life is getting out there, jumping in, and sharing your faith. And Jesus said after he witnessed to the woman at the well, Oh, the joy that awaits the sower and the reaper. And when you get those opportunities, there's a joy that you get that you don't get from any other experience when you have the opportunity to share with some, someone. And it's important to be filled up with the Spirit so that you have something to give. But when you do, um, there's a tremendous joy from it. And just not only myself sharing, but watching this little boy when we were at the truck. Oh, yeah. Pa uh, we were, we we're all passing out trucks. He grabbed <coughs> some from us, a 10-year-old boy. And then um, he disappears. He grabs some more, disappears. Then he came, grabbed some more from me, and he starts passing them out to his people, a 10-year-old boy. He was excited yep. to take part in what God was doing on the streets there in front of that hospital. It was catching. Yeah. Yeah. When you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, which the synagogue I did not, okay, he was legalism, um, there is a joy in that that is unspeakable for the Lord. We all know that, that scripture. And we experienced that in, uh, when we were in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go there, to be able to do what God allowed us to do, um, it definitely was a mind blower. Um, and you're putting yourself in a position huh. where the Holy Spirit can work. Yeah. And so that we had that anticipation of oh. God's Spirit working totally. Uh, and it's I know what, what praying for now because it's really bad over there. Um, yes. It is brutal over there now. Uh, we're the last plane out. <laughs> the yeah. last plane out. When we hit 32,000 feet, they were already taken out the airport. God was definitely watching over us in mm -hmm. uh, Any other thoughts? Um, oh, my question would be to, not to advocate for the Pharisee in any way, but so before Jesus Christ, they kind of lived, they lived by the law, mm -hmm. correct? And I, I'm not sure how the word spread or what his knowledge of of in that current moment, which is Christ, you know, who and what he brought, would would he be fully to blame if he thinks he's he's um, like he's um stick, he's trying to to teach or preach what he's thinking to be right because before before Christ came and died for our sins and everything, they were to the so I yeah, or you know, kind of sure. rather than like a change in the, <clears throat> right. the agenda before he got aware of it or something. I'm like, oh, okay, who am I talking to? And it's a high possibility of that too. But let's fold into it a plain old fashioned common sense. Yeah. I will do this for an animal, I won't do it for a human being. Yeah. Um, would your God have that happen and then go back to the Old Testament if he read his Old Testament yeah okay uh, I'm recalling the story of uh, a warrior by the name of David and his men were very hungry and they went into the temple and guess what's in the temple sure. and that was baked there explicitly 
Mm-hmm. Well, the priest said was it. It was mm-hmm. it was an abomination if you were to touch that bread. Guess what he did? He took the bread and he yeah, ate it. Why? Because they were starving. There's a theological term. It's called duh. <laughs> <laughs> That is the issue, and, and not to put a, not to put down what you're saying, but the, the, the issue itself. Do you carry it to such a degree that you are blind to something that is so simple and it's right in front of you? <coughs> this is what this is what the, the this constant tug of war between the Pharisees and Jesus was. It was an absolute all out fight. Total, total war. Because he was bringing on a regime that they refused to accept. When, when human beings get to a point in their life, whether it be a Pharisee or, or, or whatever, to where God is saying, these are the things that you need to do, and you keep denying that, you keep fighting that. You're going to head down the wrong way. You just, you, you just are. And God is gracious. God is patient. Uh, but He won't say, "Okay, you want to keep doing that." All right. You remember Moses went before Pharaoh all those times. What's the classic line? Trouble has to say, "Let my people go." No, let my people go. No. My people, I'm not going to let your people go. No. Don't make it tougher on them. Okay? Yeah. Law. Bind it. Turn it. Twist it. One more twist. Make it tighter and tighter and tighter. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. What was the last thing that you read at the end of all of that? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God would do that? No. God just simply said, you want a hard heart? Yeah, you got it. You got it. There you go. The scripture that says God will give you the desires of your heart is exquisitely real and it's exquisitely scary. The des- God will give you the desires of your heart. If you desire to be with Him for all eternity and receive Him as Lord and Savior, He will give you that, He will give you that desire and you will receive Him as Lord and Savior. If you keep rejecting him and rejecting him and rejecting him, he will give you the desires of your heart. Basically saying, you don't want me, do you? You don't want me. You don't want to be with me. You don't want my word. You don't want the Holy Spirit. You don't want light. You want darkness. You got it. You can go into darkness for all eternity. You choose. That's a horrific, scary situation. But that's exactly what it is. God will always give us the desires of our so where is our heart? The Pharisees are, you know, the synagogue guy. His heart was strictly tied up in thou shalt nots, thou shalt nots, thou shalt nots. When there was no mercy. Then I had two points I wanted to make. The first is that when you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they are teaching, they are not reading the original word. They're doing the Mishnah and the Talmud, and they are reading what other people have said about it. Right. And they've never gone back to the original message. And Jesus warned that they were doing the traditions rather than the law. Right. And I, my other point is that I noticed that when Moses was delivering the law, mm-hmm. there were several places he would say, you shall love the Lord your God and, and then came, the law. Right. And keeping the law was a way of expressing your love for God. But when Jesus came, they were no longer loving. It was a loveless religion. And so the night he was arrested, he gave the new commandment of love one another. And he says, if you can do this, you fulfill everything else. And I don't think you can improve on that lesson. No, you can't. To love one another. <clears throat> he said, all the laws and the prophets were bound up in that one statement. Mm-hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind. And the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. 
There is the spirit versus the original of that. Yeah, and on top of what he's saying, it is religion, not relationship. We love God with all our heart first, and as we build that relationship, then we that spills out into love for others. Yeah, it does. I'm Scott. Um, whether you're talking about the Pharisee, the ruler of the synagogue, or modern day people, it brings a level of exclusivity. I'm better than you. Absolutely. Uh, how dare you challenge me? What I say is right. And what they did, whether it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the ruler of the synagogue, they would walk lockstep with the others that saw the same way they back each other up right or wrong. And when one of those people broke ranks, namely Nicodemus, yeah. and said, why don't we at least hear what he has to say? Yeah. What do you believe him now? And he suddenly became outcast and he no longer held the law. It was no longer about it was about, you have to be one of us and speak the way we speak, or else you're not one of us. And um, we always have somebody to compare ourselves to. How come we always compare them? Yeah. Who did Charlie Manson compare himself to? Yeah. Well, at least I'm, oh, can't go there. So right. I always say, at least I'm not Charlie Manson. <coughs> what did he say? At least I'm not Charlie Manson. <coughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. But um, we always compare them to make ourselves look better or feel better about ourselves. Yeah. There is a hierarchy type of a feeling and flavor there that said, like you said, um, do what I say, or do what I do. As Jesus would say, you put these laws on people, and you yourself don't even keep them. But yet, you got to do that, because I tell you, you got to do that. Yes? It's a two point that I find to make. Um, it's a passage that reminds me of something that happened to Leon and I and our son, he was smaller, uh, and um, he was playing with a neighbor's dog, and somehow whatever happened between the two, the dog got injured, and so when they approached us, they were concerned more about their dog, and never asked us if, uh, if our son got injured or anything. And, wow. and, and so what we did is just said, well, you let us know, you know, to pick up the dog to the vet, let us know what it costs and we pay for it. We can kind of tell that that is that. You know. Wow. And the other point that I want to make is that uh, in our uh, lesson this morning in the women's ministry, um, we were touching on um, man made laws versus uh, the laws of God. And uh, the point that came out was that rules and rituals of man takes the focus away from God. Mm-hmm. And our only approach to God is through Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of what the, um, they were doing there. Exactly. And one scripture, Paul's Peter, he said, obey God versus just obeying man. Because and also fear God versus fearing man. Because what do you say? What can man do? What are you going to do? You're going to kill me. Okay? He said, don't be afraid of that. Be afraid of after your death and cast you into hell. That's the one. And it's, it's a reverence. It's not it's not God with a big stick getting ready for me to mess up so he's going to smash me the second I, I mess up. That's not God. It isn't. But you're right. We have a tendency to, oh, I must do this because this is a man-made thing, so forth like this. And we forget we have in front of us God's Word that gives us everything that we could possibly need for life. And having a better life and having a life that is uh, more fulfilled and more peace. Yes. I was just going to say that they still do the same thing today. Over in Israel, they have the uh, law of the Sabbath. And so they actually have what they call the Shabbat elevator, yeah. or the Sabbath elevator. And because it's against the law to 
push a button because that's work and you're making electricity connect, which is like a fire, they have the elevator set so that it goes floor by floor up and floor by floor down and opens. Right. Well, a couple of years ago, the rabbis made a ruling that that was violating the Sabbath okay. and people should climb the stairs. <laughs> Again, the letter of the law versus helping people. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's still the, the most ridiculous, you know. But God, His Word is, uh, His yoke is easy. It's not hard. God never asks us to do something unreasonable. What does what did God say to that guy? Come, let's reason. Okay? If God says that to his creation, because it's because he loves us, and there's good reason for that. And his yoke is not heavy, it is light. But that yoke means it keeps me from going this way, it keeps me from going that way. It it is a boundary. It keeps me going down the path. He wants me to go. And that will help me. Uh, what did God say to uh, Saul of Tarsus? Remember? Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? Uh, a goad was something that would stick, you know, hit the animal, the animal would kick mm -hmm. like this, you know, kick back on it like this. Why? Why are you doing that? I, I have a direction for you, Saul, and you're going to go here. But God had to literally knock Saul off his horse and blind him. Uh, sometimes it takes that. But he will guide you. And he will advance. Really good. It sounds like these these uh, folks were living in their head. Or, uh, I mean, what I'm getting is a power, power trip, a power struggle, just to uh, uh, just what they go of what they thought was the right way of doing things. The other thing that comes to mind is the California labor laws. Yeah. Or employees, or, or <coughs> employers, I mean. Mm -hmm. There's so many laws nowadays that it's it's very difficult for an employer to keep practicing because there's just so many laws on top of laws. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is it is phenomenal. If you want to know about labor law, there's a guy back there who's like talking about labor law. <laughs> he did professionally for a whole bunch of years of labor no. laws and no labor laws. Yeah. I was keeping that a secret, Rex. This is what he did. Yeah. But his, his burden is light. Mm his -hmm. joke is light. And when we follow that, we're going to have a more fulfilled life. We're going to have a better life. Mm -hmm. and God will bless it. Just mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you for the folks in the cafe. I thank you for this is going to be online uh, tomorrow. And so I'm talking to you in the camera right now. We've been talking about the freedom really in Jesus Christ. But you see the freedom is in Christ. It's not outside of Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you really don't have that freedom. You may think you're free, but you're not. You're bound by what you feel. You're bound by the worldview. The Bible Jesus said, I've come to set you free, and the one who sets you free, if Jesus sets you free, you're free indeed, that's what the Bible says. So I want to encourage you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you can, you can do that right now. Like I said, I just want to offer a little prayer. You can receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you can speak to him right now. All you need to do is simply say these words, and it's the words, it's not the words, it's the intent of your heart. By simply saying, dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sin. I repent of my sin. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, I want to welcome you, like I said, to the family of God. I want to welcome you here at High Ground Cabin Chapel. You're welcome to be here. Get into a church that teaches the Word of God, that goes through the Bible. Not just tells you stories, but goes through the Bible, gets to the end, and it goes back and does it all over again. Because there's enough there for a million lifetimes. Mm -hmm. um, Father, I thank you so much for tonight. And I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, continue to guide us. Keep us <laughs> in the boundary, Lord. And Lord, we may serve you and serve others, Father, with that love that is there. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Two fifteen, all the ushers, counselors, and prayer teams is going to be down there. Two fifteen, and then we're going to go over everything all again. Okay. So even if you missed it, at two fifteen, that'll be there. Yesterday, I was doing this. Oh, sorry, I'm like the. Oh, I see. Great. 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 We were at Lord the Priest Conference with the experience. We went from one mountain to have experience to the next day, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and you, you 